everybody, welcome back to my channel. If you're new, welcome. My name is Zoe, but most people know me as ZA Reptiles. And today we're going to be talking about the 10 probably most outdated reptile keeping practices that I think need to go. So obviously with anything as time goes on, things change. We learn more, we do things differently, we realize some things aren't as great as they we thought they were. And this is true for a lot of things in life, but obviously very true for reptile keeping. So there's a lot of things that have changed over the years. You know, there's, there's some people that just are not good at accepting change. They like routine, they're stuck in their ways, they don't want to change things up. There's people that just don't keep up with research, so they may not be aware things are changing. And there's people that maybe are new to the hobby. You know, maybe they just, they don't know what's new information, what's old information, what should be happening, what shouldn't be happening. So with all that being said, there are still outdated keeping practices happening today. And some of them are like recently outdated and just, this is all my opinion. So feel free to disagree with me. But without further ado, my top 10 list of outdated practices that need to take a hike. Number one, the thought that animals don't need UVB. There's animals that you hear that are required to have UVB. Things like bearded dragons, Argentine tegus, uromastics, green iguanas, things that are considered sun worshippers. And then there's things like crested geckos, gargoyle geckos, um, corn snakes, milk snakes, like all your snakes that don't require UVB. Now, maybe they don't require UVB, but that doesn't mean they won't benefit from it. So we're moving into a time where it's becoming more common to provide UVB to not just the animals that require it, but all of your animals, because it has been proven that UVB does help your animal grow to be nice and healthy and strong and just live a better life than without it. So can they live without it? Absolutely. But are they only going to benefit from having it? Absolutely. So if anyone says they don't benefit from UVB, tell them they're wrong. Now where it gets a little sticky is things, there's some things that truly do benefit from less UVB and things that benefit from more UVB. So it's very important that you do get the right UVB for your animal and its needs. You don't want to overdo it. You don't want to underdo it. Number two on this list, and this might ruffle some feathers, but the thought that snakes prefer and need these dark enclosed spaces as their home. A lot of time I hear the argument that snake racks are great for pet keepers because snakes prefer dark tight spaces. And so that's all they should be given. Do you see the flaw here? So yes, snakes do prefer these dark tight spaces to make them feel safe. You know what that's called? Hides. Providing hides to your snakes will give them that dark, tight, safe space that they need while inside of a larger enclosure they can come out, explore, stretch out, hunt, get enrichment, climb, dig, whatever they feel like doing. Is my Kenyan sand boa fossorial snake? Yes. Does she spend a lot of time underground? Yes. But does she come out and climb? Absolutely. My Calabar burrowing python, voodoo, fossorial snake? Yeah. Does she climb? Absolutely. My ball python, probably the species that gets this argument the most. They live in termite mountains. They need these dark spaces. They don't like big spaces. This is a four by two by two enclosure with a quark bark sky hide from my ball python Kalua. Now Kalua is a lot shyer than my ball python Snicket. However, Kalua will still come out use all the space, curl up in his sky hide, and have people say, well, I gave it to them and they didn't use it, so they prefer the racks. Kalua didn't do all that overnight. Okay, he had to get comfortable in his surrounding. That sky hide, it took him months, months before he used it. But once he used it, he was in that thing every night. So how will you know what they will or will not use or do if you don't give them the opportunity to? All right, now that I've gotten onto my rant, number three. The thought that there is such a thing as an enclosure being too big. I get this all the time, especially on TikTok, when people ask me, you know, what enclosure size I think they should have for whatever animal. And I tell them, well, this is either what I use or this is the minimum enclosure size. But 
bigger is always better. And I get lots of arguments that there is such a thing as too big, that you don't want to go too big. Think about where these animals live in the wild. There's no walls. So the thought that there is something too big just doesn't really make sense. You feel me? There is such a thing as too spacious and too open, which can lead to problems. So you want to make sure you are utilizing the space well, filling it with enrichment, cork bark, tubes, hides, driftwood, branches, plants, things to hide in, things to climb on, things to hide behind, around, whatever. Fill the space and they will feel safe and they will utilize it and explore and just have fun and it's so much more fun to watch them that way. As long as they can find their food and they can find water, we're good. Number four, we kind of already touched on it, but it's the thought that ball pythons strictly live in termite mounds and don't climb. I already told you guys, Kalua climbs. He climbs up into a sky high. Snicket, my banana ball python, biggest climber, oh my gosh climbing all over. Termite mounds, do they go in termite mounds? Yes. Are they strictly in termite mounds 24-7? No. In fact, male ball pythons from the wild have been found to have birds in their system, like nesting birds that would be in trees. So clearly they are coming out of their termite mounds and getting birds out of trees. So you can't tell me they don't climb and that all they do is live in termite mounds. They don't explore and hunt for their food and whatnot. I do want to do a whole video strictly on this in the future. Um, I've been collecting articles and science and research and whatnot to work on a video. Just that one's going to take lots of time and planning. So someday, but I'm working on it. Number five, the use of coil UVB. Also T8, but more so the coil UVB. So these are becoming outdated products. They really don't work that well. People will argue up and down for coil UVBs or compact UVBs. And I have used them. I have tested them with solar meters. They suck. And so it wasn't like a one-off. The nature center I work at, turtles used to all have those compact UVBs. Switched out every six months. When I came and took over animal care, we ordered a solar meter. Those UVBs had maybe been switched for one month. I went around and tested them with the solar meter. Not a single one was putting out like any UVB. Not a single one. Mind you, that's like nine or ten different bulbs. Not a single one. None of those turtles were getting UVB off of bulbs that were only one month old. They also don't cover a large surface area like the linear UVBs do. They don't last as long. They don't have as much of a reach. They die off quicker. So it's just why, 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 why even use them? So that leads me to T8s. T8s aren't bad, they're just not as good as T5s. The T5s are what I use for all of my enclosures. They're stronger, they last longer. They're just, in my opinion, so much better. They're advertised to last a year. Granted, most of the time they go over a year, but don't try that unless you have a solar meter to make sure they're still working. T8s are advertised for six months. Six months versus one year. I mean, you can use T8s if you want to, but I'm going with the bulb that's gonna last a lot longer and have a better output. Next one, ooh, we're gonna ruffle more feathers. Live feeding snakes. Every time I talk about live feeding on TikTok, everyone's like, well, bugs, 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 what about bugs? Feeding, you have to feed live bugs. I'm not talking about lizards eating bugs. I'm talking about snakes eating live rats, live mice, live guinea pigs, like any live rodent. Now I understand, sometimes you have to feed live. If the snake doesn't take frozen thawed, you do what you gotta do. I get that, I've been there. But if your snake takes frozen thawed and you are feeding live strictly for the entertainment value, that's kinda icky, that's kinda gross. Not here for that. Okay, we're all about being ethical around here. So we're gonna use frozen thawed rodents that hopefully didn't suffer during death, they died humanely. 
and feed them to our snakes. And this way our snakes aren't being put in danger either. See, as entertaining as some may think it is to watch a snake take down a rabbit, if a rabbit or a giant rodent, giant rat fights back, now you've put your snake in danger and at risk of being injured. Why would you want that? Just for like two minutes of entertainment. So we are here for the frozen thawed feeding, not live, feeding already dead. It's ethical for the food, it's safer for the snake, it's just better all around. Plus you can buy them in bulk and store them in your freezer. It's a lot cheaper and just so much easier. Next up is using reptiles for their scare factor. It's no secret that a lot of people are scared of reptiles, scared of snakes, scared of lizards, Talking more than reptiles, scared of tarantulas, scared of cockroaches, scorpions, the things that we tend to keep, right? I love to see that we are starting to move to an age where we aren't using these animals for scare factors, but of course there are still gonna be people that do that, that get their snakes and they know that this person's scared of the snakes and they're gonna run up and play pranks using these animals. We're not about that, okay? I know it generates views online. People love to see these pranks because they're weird and have like no consideration for the animal's safety at all. But also if we do this and we're using the animals in this way, we're not creating an appreciation for these animals and showing just how awesome they actually are. Now we're instilling fear into people. We don't want them to fear the animals we love. We want them to appreciate the animals we love and have a respect for them. So 2023, out with the scare factor. We're not using that anymore. No, we want people to love and appreciate our animals. Next, feeding strictly canned insects as your like your main meal for your animals. Canned insects, sure, use them as a treat or something, top your salad with them, but they really don't make a great staple. So I hate walking through the pet store and just seeing canned insects because it just seems so easy. Everyone's like, I don't want to keep live insects. I don't want to keep crickets. They're gross. They stink. They're freaky. Let me just get the canned crickets and my life will be easier. Yeah, but they're not really as great as feeding live crickets. Live insects, you can gut load, make sure that they're very nutritious, they're, it's movement, and a lot of reptiles prefer movement to their food. They don't want food that's been coming out of a nasty can that's just sitting there dead and gross. They want the movement. It's gonna trigger their hunting response, they're gonna eat it. It's also good enrichment, so if you're releasing crickets into enclosure for them to chase, great enrichment getting their exercise, it's making them hunt, it's making them do a natural behavior. So out with the canned insects, in with the live insects. So next, thinking that reptiles contain like no emotional capacity. They have no emotions, they don't care about you, they're not gonna connect with you. Personally, I haven't looked much into the science behind it, it's on my list. However, from personal experience, I can very strongly say that they do have the ability to have these different concepts. You know, um, a fear is an emotion. Stress is an emotion. So clearly they're able to feel these emotions. Can they recognize their owners? Absolutely. Do they feel attached to their owners? Absolutely. If we look at like iguanas, green iguanas putting in the work, they can absolutely form a bond with their owner and maybe not like others. Arcadius and I had a very, very strong bond. I mean, he knew who his mom was, you know, and other ones like Puka, my water dragon. My boyfriend recently said that, you know, she didn't really like him. She has started to warm up to him, but if I walk into the room, she does not want anything to do with him. She's looking at me. She doesn't want anything to do with him. She's going to be mean to him, but if I leave, she's nice to him again. If I'm not here, sure, she'll take food from him. Now that's a weird case because I'm more, one, more than one example. I've had animals absolutely love Billy and maybe not attached to me. So Percy, my Cuban night animal who passed away last year. We were hit or miss, you know. He would come out and hang out. It took some work to get him out um, and then to calm down. And so, you know, we, it was fine. But with Billy, they were like two peas in a freaking pod. It was insane. And Reptar, my Aki monitor who I got from the Nature Center, he was miserable at the nature center. He was not having a good time. I was the only one that really handled him. I was the only one that could really handle him. 
and he was still very crazy and just like would not sit and hang out with you. We brought him here. Now, yes, change of environment, but almost instantly him and Billy became best buds. He will sit with Billy while Billy games while I'm at work. Like it is so strange. Him and Billy are just like, so that kind of goes along with, you know, using reptiles for that scare factor, using them in pranks. We're not taking those reptiles into consideration. And I do fully believe that they have emotional responses to what it is you're doing. All right, we're getting deep and philosophical. We're moving on because that's not, I guess, so much of a practice. It's me just ranting about something, but it made the list. So on to number 10. And this for me is a huge one. It's one of the biggest ones for me. And that is that you don't continue your research after getting your animals. That practice needs to go. Because if there's anything we've learned from this list, it's that over time, we continue to learn things. We continue to improve. Products improve. Keeping improves. People go out to the wild and just learn new things as we watch these animals. So if you're not continuing on your research, you're missing out on awesome advances that are going to improve the lives of your animals and make you a better keeper. So always, always, always keep researching. Even if you have an animal, that does not mean your research is done. Keep up with the research, keep up reading. That way, if new information comes out, you will know and you can improve with the hobby as the hobby improves. All right, that is it for today's video. If you have any additions, to outdated practices you think need to go that I may have missed, leave them in the comments below. And as always, thank you guys for watching. We'll see you for the next video. Bye.